everyone. All right, who's excited to be at church this morning? Woo, good. So we're going to take just a few minutes to read through scripture together. And I actually had prepared a really special song for you. But for some reason, they thought that wouldn't be a good idea. So we'll stick to scripture. But I've been really enjoying this week, just walking through Advent with you, the church family. Have you all been enjoying it? It's been so good. But I've got a confession to make. The hardest part about Advent for me has been intentionally slowing down. You know, especially this season, we can get so caught up in the busyness of life and especially with everything going on around us. But something beautiful happened this week when I did slow down. When I go to scripture, which I can often just hurry right through, I read it in a different way and the words came to life for me. And it showed me again, it reminded me how beautiful and how powerful God's word is. And I'm telling you right now, his promises are just as true today as they were thousands of years ago. So as we read Psalm 23 together, and we're focused this week on the peace of God that we have through Jesus Christ, I want every single word we read out loud to be life-giving to you. And I want you to say it with me. The words will be up on the screen and we'll read them together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, you are the good shepherd. 
we believe that your word is true. We believe in your promises and we know that the hope and the joy and the peace and the love that we find in you transcends our understanding, Lord. We rest in you now and I invite you into this moment. Just fill this room with your peace that passes all understanding. We thank you, Lord, for what's to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's all join our voice together. Let's see. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceive in Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, my God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended. Descended into darkness. You rose in glorious light. Forever seen.
let's just give God more praise this morning. So good to be reminded of what we believe in, amen? Are you glad you came this morning? Hey, we'll do this, turn around, wave at somebody, welcome them to church, and then have a seat. Hey, so good to see you this weekend. I want to welcome everybody watching online, wherever you're watching, however you're watching. So glad that you are spending your Sunday morning hanging out with us here at Church on the Move. Tulsa, good to see everyone here in the room. And I want to say a special welcome to anyone that's new this weekend. If I haven't met you, my name's Chris. This is Priscilla. We're a couple of the pastors here at our Tulsa location. And if you are new, we don't want you to stay that way. So do this for us. Text NEW to 23101. We're going to send you a gift card just to say thank you for spending your weekend with us here in the room as well. Text NEW to 23101. And church family, can we put our hands together? Welcome anybody that's new this weekend, hanging out with us for the first time. So glad that you're here. And whether you're new to church on the move or you've been here for a while, if you're ready to get connected into this church family, then we want to invite you to a gathering that we do once a month called Next Move. That's a place where you get to hear directly from our lead pastor, Whit George. You get to meet our team, but more importantly, you get to figure out how to get connected to the life and community of the church. Our next one is January 9th. You can sign up right now by texting NEXT to 23101. And Chris, it's already getting full. It's yeah. absolutely incredible, but we cannot wait to hang out with you crazy that our next one is in a new year. 2020 is about over. Come on, somebody. And uh, so we're excited to kick that off as we start the new year. Today, we are in part two of a series on Advent. We're actually going to be talking about peace. Pastor Whit George will be continuing that series. And we kicked off, it's been a fun week for those of us that are partaking in this. It's been a lot of fun. I have an Advent confession to make. And when I said this last night, I kind of got booed from behind me. But uh, we kind of Advent cheated. Uh -oh. uh, we read the actual song instead of singing it. Is that okay? That's what we did. But we had a lot of fun gathered around the table and eating food. Hey, believe me, we did not sing in my house either because I cannot carry a tune at all. But anyways, you can partake with that by texting ADVENT to 23101. You can also grab a guide on your way out if you missed it last week. But something else we're doing in this season and the way we end our year here at Church on the Move is through what we call our compassion offering. And you guys are such a generous church. So cool to be a part of your team. And over the last three years, you've been able to do a lot of different projects that have made a difference locally and around the world. And I wanna share this update with you from one of our friends that we partnered with last year. His name's Oleg, and he is the director of New Hope Eurasia that's based in Moldova. And his organization is, is really founded upon the idea of helping uh, human trafficking situations of women, children, uh, families get up on their feet and rescue them from human trafficking. Some of you, you may remember this story last year as we actually were hearing from them that there were situations where uh, kids were having their organs harvested and sold for profit. And Church on the Move just decided, hey, we're going to help this organization with building their transition homes. It's literally helping women and babies get safe and get up on their feet. And we meant and had every intention of sending a mission trip group over this year in 2020, but obviously because of the pandemic, we had to put that on hold. But we were able to go ahead, because of you, send them $100,000 to finish out one of their transition homes. You're such a great church. You've been able to help at least six moms and six babies get safe as a result of your investment. We can't thank you enough. There's so many ways, that, too many, count, too many countless ways that you have been able to support things that are happening. It's because of your generosity that we get to do this as a church and as a church family. So if you've came ready to give right now, there's a couple of easy ways you can do that. You can text the word GIVE to 23101 and the amount, you can follow the prompts there. Or if you're ready to give above and beyond your tithe to the Compassion Offering, you can text CO and the amount. Or we have drop boxes on, our, on your way out the door. But you are such a generous, faithful church. Yeah, that's right. You've already given a date. The date we've kind of circled on the calendar to bring our best is December 19th and 20th. And in fact, you've already given more than $200,000. Congratulations, guys. You're a great, great church. Last thing I want to do this weekend Every week we pray over our givers and what I have in my, or over our giving. And what I have in my hand today here is a list of all of our givers here at Church on the Move Tulsa. And the reason I have this is because I wanted to pray over you specifically today. I know 2020 has been a, a year of uncertainty. I've talked with business owners who I know aren't taking a paycheck right now to try to keep their business afloat. I know people that have been laid off, lost their jobs. And sometimes we can get in the habit as a church family of coming in here every week and going through the motions of giving 
but not praying over God to work in our lives financially, not praying that God, and not, not we can forget that God is our provider and that he's our Lord and Savior and that he shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. And so I wanna pray over you specifically today as we pray over our giving. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray over each person on this list today. Lord, that they're giving faithfully, maybe not out of abundance, but out of lack, out of sacrifice, out of a willingness to follow you and continue to fund your mission and vision for your church. I pray that you would work in the lives of each person in here today giving. Bless them. Open up windows, open up doors of opportunity to work in their life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. We thank you for a great service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and Merry Christmas to everybody. Glad you're here this weekend. If you're new or you're joining us online for the first time, my name is Witt and uh, I am the pastor here. And I'm a little excited this weekend because uh, if you didn't know, our Lincoln Christian School Bulldogs are advancing to their second state championship, which is something worth celebrating. It was an amazing game on Friday night. If you missed it, uh, just tune in. It'll be on ESPN Classic, I'm sure, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, it was a great, great game, and uh, so we're going to play in our second back-to-back -back state championship. We're actually playing Holland Hall, and weirdest thing, just the way the whole system works, we've got to drive two hours to play a team that's 10 minutes away, but we're playing Friday night at UCO at 7 p.m., and if you're here in the Tulsa area or even in the OKC area, wherever, uh, we would love to have you come out and uh, support our young men as they battle for a uh, second back-to-back, -back, actually third overall state championship for us in football, but it would be our second uh, and it'll be two in a row, which would be really, really cool. So that's, that, that's awesome. And then it's week two of Advent, and I hope that you've been able to jump into this Advent season with us and really celebrate. We had a couple of families over at our house last uh, Sunday night, and we're doing it again this, this Sunday night. It, it is so, so meaningful. It was so cool to have these families, and we had teenagers ranging from, ranging from 18 to 7 years old. We were all gathered in a big circle in our living room, and um, I had to give a little bit of a talk beforehand just to kind of set everybody up for it, especially the young people. I just said, hey, listen, this might feel a little uncomfortable to you, and it might be a little different. We're going to have a little bit of silence. We're going to sing a song. We're going to ask you to pray. I'm just going to ask you to lean into this and not make jokes about it or try to crack a joke. You might think that our kids are extra spiritual because they're pastor's kids, but no, they are not. And, and so we just asked them, and it was so cool um, just to see them participate, to share what God is doing in them, what they're going through right now, where they were looking for hope in their life. Um, they prayed over us. It was just a really, really meaningful experience. And so if you haven't yet got one of these uh, Advent guides, um, I would love for you to jump in. And all it is really is just a gathering weekly. And then there's a daily sort of thing that you can do as well that th this will walk you through. But it's just gathering together weekly. It could be with family, could be with friends, could be in person, could be via Zoom. But it's just something that we're doing collectively together as a church. And this is really great. So what we're gonna do, and let me just kind of give you a sort of uh, snapshot of what's going to happen as we kind of come toward the end of the year. What we're going to do is we've got a couple more weeks of Advent. Our last in-person service, let me say that again, our last in-person service of the year will be December 19th and 20th. That's two weeks from this weekend. We'll gather in person for the last time in 2020. We will do an online Christmas experience Christmas Eve. Some of you all have asked, are you doing your Christmas program this year? And the answer is we're moving it to online. It'll be Christmas Eve. We're calling it Christmas Together, and it is so cool. The team's been working on it for a long time, and uh, this is going to be just a really beautiful night for us to gather together as a church family, both in person and virtually all over the place. I know that this year is different than most years where um, maybe family isn't able to come into town the same way. We're not able to gather in the same way that we, we used to be able to. And so what we wanted to do is to put something together where we could kind of join up together, whether we're in Oklahoma or Colorado or Texas or wherever you got family, you could be able to log on at the same time and we could all experience Christmas together. And so that will happen on Christmas Eve. That's how we'll culminate our sort of Advent season. Now, like I said, our last in-person service is the 19th and 20th. And that's also a significant weekend for us. 
We're going to do some kind of special Christmas stuff that weekend. That's also our um, compassion offering weekend where we're bringing our very best to kind of kick off the compassion offering season. Of course, we'll be giving to our compassion offering through um, probably all of 2021. We've got a big goal to raise this year, and it's going to take us a little while to get there, but we're going to bring our very best on, the Dece on December 19th and 20th to kind of get that thing kick-started, and um, that'll be a really special weekend. Now, here's kind of what's happening right now, and I wanted to tell this to you guys specifically in the room in this service, and for those of you who come, when you come to this location, you come uh, at this service, 10 a.m. Um, right now, we're in a little bit of a, like, a, like a, an attendance lull, and it's just normal for December. Generally, we kind of have this sort of calm before the storm this time of year. But uh, earlier, in fact, August, September, we were seeing some, like in this particular service, we were pretty much maxing out what we could fit in this room. And what we're going to see is maybe December 19th and 20th and probably into January because in January there'll, there'll always be a, a surge of new people coming back to church. And we're going to be inviting people back to church in January. We want to see people come back to church. I know right now it feels like maybe a time we shouldn't be inviting people to church, but let me just tell you, people are hurting and they need peace, they need hope, they need joy, they need Jesus. So we're just going to, we're throwing open the doors of the church and we're saying, come back to church. And so I want to challenge you, one, to be inviting people. I, I think this is a great time, actually, to be inviting people to church. But two, I want to challenge you to consider moving out of this service. And let me tell you why. Because when new people come, by and large, they want to come to this service time. And I don't blame them. It's a great time to come to church. But the problem is we're, we're going to max out this room and what we can fit in here with social distancing. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to consider, I need just a, a couple hundred, maybe 300 people to consider moving to Saturday night at 5 p.m. or, because we've got plenty of room on Saturday night at 5 p.m., or we have an 11 o'clock service. You may not know this, but right up the hill here in our youth building, we have a, a service I teach live. The same band plays up there, and you might go youth building. That in, typically at a church, youth building means kind of second class experience. Not at church on the move. That's actually a nicer building than this building. And so I, I think the best experience that you can have on a Sunday at Church on the Move is actually right up there at 11. And we've got a, we've got a lot of room up there for uh, people to come check that out. If you've got kids, it's an amazing kids experience up there. I think, honestly, the best that we offer. And so um, if you would consider switching service times, just by switching service times, you can help us reach people. That starts on December 19th and 20th. We could use your help there. And then I'm telling you, again in January, we want to see people coming back to church, and you could help us make room for them and creating a space for them to reach people for Jesus, because how many of you know, we need it right now. We need a little hope. We need a little peace. We need this. And so uh, you can help us with that. So that's, ha that's what's happening the end of the year. So what we'll do, 19th and 20th, last in-person service, uh, Christmas Eve is online, and then that following weekend, which I think is the 26th and 27th. That's also online. And then January, we'll be back in person again and, and going at it for Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get 2020 over with. And I believe that 2021 is going to be a little different year than 2020. Can I get an amen from somebody? Come on. So I'm looking forward to it. Now, like I said, this is Advent week two. And if you're unfamiliar with Advent and what it means or what it's all about, uh, Advent simply means this. It just means coming or arrival. And it speaks specifically of the coming or arrival of Jesus. Uh, the first coming or arrival of Jesus was 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, right? We celebrate that every Christmas. But we also, at Advent, look forward to the second coming of Christ, which we hope and pray is soon, right? So we're looking forward to Jesus' return, him coming again. But then we also celebrate and remember that Jesus comes to us now. It's not just about the past. And it's not just about one day in the future, but we recognize that Jesus is with us now in the present. There are traditionally four themes of Advent. We've been walking through them week after week after week. Last week, we talked about hope. This week, we're talking about peace. Next week will be joy. And then we'll culminate that December 19th and 20th talking about love. This week, though, as I said, we're talking about peace. And I want to kind of kick this discussion off by asking you this question. What comes to mind for you when we talk about peace? 
What images do you see? Where does your mind go whenever I say we're talking about peace? Maybe for some of you, this is what pops into your mind, right? Is this your peaceful place, right? You just need a little bit of warm sun, a little sand between your toes, private beach, you know, that kind of thing. Just sitting there on a, on a beach chair, lounging, reading a book, just relaxing. I don't know about you. I can take a nap on a beach like nowhere on earth. I just love the rhythm of the waves. It just, it's peaceful for me. Maybe this is your peaceful spot. For others of you, maybe this is the kind of thing that comes to mind. It's just somewhere in nature, right? You just like to be where there's maybe a stream or maybe in a mountain trail, just somewhere out where you can kind of get away from it all. You can hear those nature sounds. It just, it's peaceful for you. Maybe it's getting in a deer stand. I don't know, but it just, it's getting out in nature, right? And you just, you just feel at peace there. Uh, maybe for others of you, it looks something more like this, just a spa day, right, where you can kind of get away, it's a day all about you, you're just being pampered, I don't know, massage, facial, that all kind of thing. Maybe for you, just like this is your peaceful kind of happy spot. Uh, in my house, uh, peace for Heather and I, because we have five kids, looks a lot like this. Just anytime the kids go to sleep, right? Where, where, where are my moms and dads at? Come on, somebody. Like, you just need a little of this in your life. You can get those kids. Everybody's sleeping at once. <sighs> right? We can just kind of relax and, uh, and, and, and just feel a little bit of peace. Um, there are some of you who are responsible types in the room, and for you, peace looks something like this. Just having all your bills paid, right? All your responsibilities taken care of. Pay off that credit card balance. Get rid of that loan, whatever it is. Bills paid you feel like you can rest a little bit. Um, everybody in my house knows this about me. For me to kind of experience peace in the George home, uh, this has to happen. We have to have a clean house. Anybody else like that? I, I could come home from preaching like all day. My voice is shot. I'm tired. I'm just ready to lay down. I walk in. The kids have made a mess of the kitchen and the living room. I want to lay down on the couch. It doesn't matter how tired I am. I'll start sweeping up, cleaning up, picking up because I cannot lay down in a mess. I need things to be nice and clean. Anybody feel me? You know what I'm talking like that. That's just me. I need things to be clean before I can relax. Uh, maybe for you, uh, peace looks something like this, just relational peace, no tension, no turmoil. Whenever me and my wife, me and my husband, me and my boyfriend, girlfriend, when we're fighting, going, I just, I, I, I can't relax, there's no peace. Maybe for you, it's, it's relational peace. Here's the thing, and I, I show all of those images just to make this point, that for many of us, I think our vision of peace is the absence of something. Specifically, the absence of strife, stress, turmoil, chaos. When we can kind of get rid of those things, we feel like we can exhale a little bit. I, I call this situational peace. And it's when the situation or circumstances of our life kind of fall into place, things feel right, we got everything just the way we want it, our world works and is sort of arranged in the way that we like. We feel good when we're in the right situation. And let's be honest, situational peace is from God. There's nothing necessarily wrong with being in a really great situation for a little bit. I think as human beings, we need situational peace from time to time. You're not designed to live in chaos, confusion, turmoil, uncertainty for your whole life. And so when life gets to be a little bit too much and we pull away and we just need a little quiet space and quiet time or just to get away for a little bit, there's nothing wrong with that. But situational peace is limited. And here's why. Situational peace doesn't always work because situational peace is situational. It, it, it only happens when the circumstances of our lives are arranged in just the right way. The biblical idea of peace is a little different than this. Paul, who was an apostle, which basically means he was like an ambassador for Jesus, uh, wrote this letter to a church in Philippi. And this is what he writes in Philippians chapter 4. He writes this in verse 7, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here Paul describes what he calls the peace of God. This is different than situational peace. 
And he's letting us know that there's a peace available to us that supersedes or surpasses understanding. You could almost say that this is like an irrational peace. It's a peace that goes beyond our ability to make sense of it all. In other words, there's a confidence available to us in the middle of chaos, in the middle of the storm, when our situation isn't exactly how we would want it, we can still find peace and stability and confidence. There's a story in Mark's gospel of Jesus with his disciples going across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And the Sea of Galilee is kind of interesting. It sits actually 700 feet below sea level, which means that drafts of air can come up over the mountains down into the Sea of Galilee and storms can blow up on that sea really quickly, really violent storms. And at this occasion, Jesus and his disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and one such storm blew up. And it says that the wind was howling and the waves were crashing. In fact, the waves were so big that the boat was filling up with water. It's at this moment that the disciples, like all of us would, they hit the panic button. They're freaking out. They're in fear for their lives. And so they go looking for Jesus. And do you know where they find him? In the stern of the boat on a cushion, asleep. And this is a picture of biblical peace, the, the peace of God that Paul is describing here in Philippians 4. It's an irrational peace, a peace that supersedes situation and circumstance. The biblical word for this kind of peace in the Old Testament is this word shalom, and it just means to be whole or complete, lacking nothing. If a wall was uh, completely built and it had all of its pieces in place, you could say that wall was at peace. If a shepherd had all of his flock and they were all accounted for, you could say that that shepherd had shalom in his flock, peace in his flock. It's interesting because when I think about how we talk about people who are dealing with a lot of anxiety or worry, if we see someone who's in a really stressful, kind of crazy, chaotic situation, we say things like, oh, they're really falling apart right now. They're coming undone. They went to pieces. Their life is a mess. It's interesting the visual then that we have of what it is to live or to be in chaos is this idea of fragmentation, of coming undone, breaking apart, which is interestingly the opposite of what's described here with shalom, which is to be complete or whole. And isn't that the feeling that we all want? to be in a place where we feel like we're together, where we're solid, where we're planted. That's what it is to have peace, isn't it? You feel whole and complete and planted and, and stable. In Isaiah's uh, prophecy about the Messiah, hundreds of years before Jesus would come, he described Jesus in this way in Isaiah chapter 9. These are words that we read around Christmas time, this time of year, every year. And Isaiah the prophet writes this about Jesus. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. When Isaiah is describing the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, it's interesting that twice he talks about how he, this Messiah, will be a bringer of peace. He describes him as the prince of peace. What is a prince? A prince is someone with authority, position, either by blood or by conquest, but they're someone who has authority, power, and position to impose their will on a particular area, the, the area that they rule and reign in. Wherever they have power, they have the authority to do something about whatever it is that they want to do in their sphere of influence. Isaiah says Jesus is one such ruler. He describes a government that will be on his shoulders. He calls him the prince of peace. In other words, his rule, his reign, his power will be associated with this idea of shalom, wholeness, completeness. 
And isn't that what we're looking for whenever we find ourselves in chaos? I don't know about you, but this year has been one such year for that. And when we find ourselves in situations like we do in 2020, we go looking for someone who can maybe do something about our situation, somebody who's more powerful than we are, somebody with authority to act and do something and make things right again in the world. When Jesus and his disciples were in the boat in Mark's Gospel chapter 4 and the wind is blowing and the waves are crashing and they're panicking and they're saying, well, what are we going to do? They go to Jesus, they find him asleep in the boat and look at what they say to him. They say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Have you ever been there with God? Has it ever felt like to you that God was asleep on the job, that he had just no interest really in what's happening in your life. You're crying out to him. You're panicked. You feel like your world is crumbling all around you. You're in the chaos. You're in the storm. The waves are crashing into the boat of your life. And you're wondering, God, do you even care? Are you available? If I cry out to you, will you even do anything? That's where the disciples were. They go. They, they start pushing Jesus to wake him up. And he responds to them. He awoke and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. He brought calm to the situation. And then he turns to his disciples and he says this, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, on the surface, this is almost an insulting question. I mean, have you seen Jesus, the wind, the waves? Are you aware of the situation? Do you realize? I mean, it's, it's not unnatural for us to be panicked in the kind of storm that we're in. And again, maybe you felt that way. Maybe you've been through something like that. It's like, this is not a small thing. The diagnosis that I just got is not a small thing. Me losing my job, not a small thing. What's happening with my kids? Kind of a big deal, Jesus. What is he saying then? He's saying, do you realize who you're with? Guys, do you, do, do you understand who's in the boat with you? Do you have any idea what it's meant for me to even be here right now? See, they had no clue that they were in the presence of the almighty God, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-consuming God had become flesh and blood, had passed through Mary's womb and was with them right there in the boat. And what they didn't get was that they were in his presence. They were with someone, maybe the only person who could do something about the situation that they're in. Look at how they responded. It says they were filled with great fear and they said to one another, look at this, who then is this? In other words, we, we don't even know who this is. And the disciples here are learning a lesson that I think every disciple of Jesus has to, at one point or another, learn about peace. And it's this thought right here. Peace is the product of presence. When I was five, six years old, I remember being terrified of Oklahoma thunderstorms. We get great, huge thunderstorms in Oklahoma, and I can remember being very young, and the storm would roll in, the thunder would roll and boom, and the lightning would flash. You know what I'm talking about, those kind of thunderstorms where they get right over your house, and the thunder booms, and your whole house just begins to shake, that kind of thunderstorm, and when it would get to be too intense, especially at nighttime, I would crawl out of my bed and I would run downstairs and I would go into my parents' room because I just wanted to be in the presence of mom and dad. You get this, if you have kids, you've been through this too, because when kids get freaked out, what do they do? They run to mom and dad because somehow there's comfort in mom and dad's presence. There's peace in mom and dad's presence. Earlier this year, whenever the pandemic really started to get real in Oklahoma, and it really happened, I don't know, in like a 24-hour period, it kind of went from being this sort of 
threat out there in another place to being like right up in our business in just a really rapid amount of time. And I remember when all of that was kind of going down and we were trying to understand and figure out what was happening, I was getting texts from friends, probably like you. People with military connections were reaching out to me saying, hey, my brother-in-law's you know, in the National Guard and they're telling him that they're gonna send the National Guard and you might wanna go get some money out of the bank. You might wanna go fill all your cars up with gas because they're gonna shut the city down. I don't know if you were hearing those rumors or getting those same texts like I was. And so I grabbed my family and I said, okay, we're gonna get our cars and we're gonna go fill up with gas. And so me and Heather and my oldest son, Fran, who's 18, we went down to Quick Trip and we were there at the pump filling up our cars with gas. My son, Francis, who's 18, is very independent, doesn't really, you know, he's, at, he's just at that age where he doesn't need mom and dad, you know what I'm talking about? And, and we're there at the pump and he, he looks over at me and I, I remember the look on his face, this look of concern with a little bit of fear mixed in. And he looks at me and he says, Dad, is everything gonna be okay? Even at 18 years old, even Mr. Independent, the one who doesn't need mom and dad anymore, and when the storm gets to be too much, we go looking for the presence of someone who can bring us comfort. And friends, that's what Advent is all about. That's what this season is meant to teach us. See, I think sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing a pretty good job kind of handling everything. Often it takes a little bit of chaos. It takes a little bit of a storm for us to be reminded that we're not nearly as in control as we like to think we are. And when the world starts breaking down around us, we run somewhere. Some of us run to our bunker. Some of us try to turn to distraction and entertainment to take our minds off of everything that's going on. Some of us turn to a substance to just try to escape it all. But we're all running somewhere. Christians are just people who have learned to run to Jesus. We seek to be in his presence. And that's what Advent is about. It's about intentionally inviting the presence of Jesus into our lives in this season. We ought to live this way year round, but this season especially, we should be reminded that peace, shalom, that kind of wholeness, completeness, that confidence in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the storm, comes from being in the presence of Jesus. Peter Drucker, the kind of renowned management leadership guru, famously said that there are four jobs in America he thinks are the hardest of all. President of the United States, president of a university, hospital CEO, and lastly, he thought pastor was the fourth hardest job in the country. And in the last three and a half years, if you don't know, my dad pastored Church on the Move for 30 years, three and a half years ago. He kind of passed the baton to me, so to speak. And now I've been pastor of Church on the Move for the last three and a half years. And I got to tell you, the first year I was like, okay, okay, kind of, I, I know what this is about. I got this. Uh, but then as I kind of got a little bit deeper into it, I started to feel the weight. In fact, just before I had stepped into this role, I had all kind of pastor friends from Judd Wilhite to Luke Barnett talk to me and I would say, okay, tell me about, you know, what do I need to know and what should I expect? And they just said, well, there's going to be a weight that's going to hit you, that you're going to feel like a tangible weight. And the first year I was like, where is it? I'm either I'm really strong or this church is really light. I don't know what the deal is. But, but as I got into it a little bit further, it, it, it finally hit. And in 2020, boom, man, it really hit. And I'm not telling you this because I want sympathy or some kind of pat on the back or, or whatever so that you'll feel bad for me. That, that's not it at all. What I'm telling you is that as a pastor, one of the things that I've come to really feel and experience, especially this year, is that regularly I'm facing things that I feel completely unqualified for. I mean, there are situations, and if I'm being honest with you, there are moments more often than I might like to admit where I find myself going, I, I don't know what to do with this. 
I don't exactly know how to respond. It's not even just that some situations are just so crazy that like I just can't figure it out, but it's just the, 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 the magnitude of it all. I mean, in, in any given day, there's a dozen or more issues that are serious issues and they're sort of related and kind of separate. And then in the middle of all of that, you're trying to write and prepare a sermon week in and week out and, and, and it's taxing and it's exhausting. And, and I find myself, and here's what I do, in those moments of being overwhelmed, in those moments of feeling a little bit like the disciples where the waves are crashing into the boat, right? And you're feeling like, oh my goodness, how will I deal with all of this? I learned something. And I learned something from watching my dad who pastored for 30 years. Can I tell you, it's not easy to pastor faithfully for 30 years. But I watched him do it, and this is what I saw. When he found himself in a place where he felt a little overwhelmed, where it all just kind of became too much, here's what I saw. He would immediately turn to Jesus. He would get in the presence of Jesus. He would run like a five, six-year-old kid down to his parents' room looking for comfort, looking for peace. He would turn to Jesus because in the presence of Jesus, there is peace. And when I find myself going, I don't know how to deal with this, I hit my knees and I go, Jesus, help me. I, I'm not sure what I should do right now. I don't know which way I should go. And here's what I found, is that it isn't so much about Jesus coming in and waving his magic wand and making all of my problems go away. It's just when I get close to him, I feel this sense of confidence and calm and it's this overwhelming feeling that Son, everything's going to be okay. You can't see it now. You don't know how it's all going to work out. You don't see the future, but I do. You're with me, so why be so afraid? Peace is the product of presence. The question I have for you is this. Whose presence are you inviting into your life? Where are you spending your time? What are you dwelling on, meditating on, thinking about? Can I just tell you, if what you're doing, all you're doing is listening to music and watching videos and, and, and bouncing around from website to website and then passing out, falling asleep, waking up, repeat, and it's like that's your cycle, you're not going to have peace. You're going to feel the chaos. If all you're doing is tuning into the news and trying to scroll through all the different sites to find what you think are the facts and try to understand everything that's going on so that you can feel some sense of control, I, I got to tell you, you're not going to feel peace. You're only going to feel more chaos and confusion. It's not that we bury our heads in the sand as Christians to what's going on around us. It's just that we spend more time in God's presence than we do trying to figure everything out there out. Peace is a product of presence. Last week we read from Revelation chapter 22. It's the last chapter in the Bible. And if there's a theme of Revelation 22, and really you could draw this theme throughout the whole of the New Testament, it's that Jesus is coming again. He came once, yes, but when he left, he said, I will come back. And in Revelation 22, the last verse in scripture says this, he who testifies to these things, this is Jesus speaking, he says, yes, I am coming soon. And in response, John the apostle writes, amen, come, Lord Jesus. Did you know that these words, come, Lord Jesus, which are repeated over and over and over again, especially in Revelation 22, that this is a prayer that you can pray? Because after all, what else is a prayer but talking to God? So when John writes, come, Lord Jesus, he's communicating with God, which means this is a prayer, and this is a prayer that you can pray. In fact, I'd like to challenge you this week to pray this prayer regularly and situationally. You may be 
driving to an important meeting. Come, Lord Jesus. You might be sitting down to have an important conversation with your spouse or one of your kids or a family member or a coworker, and before you sit down in that conversation, you can say, come, Lord Jesus. You might be waking up on Monday and you don't feel like going to work today, and it's just a come, Lord Jesus. Jesus promised us that he would never leave us or forsake us. Have you heard that before? Jesus said, I'm with you till the end of the age. I will never leave you or forsake you. And so in one sense, it's not really appropriate for us to say, Jesus, come be with us, because he's already promised to be with us. So then why then should I pray, come Lord Jesus, if he's already promised to be with me? Well, let me put it to you like this. 21 years ago, Heather and I stood right here on this stage. I guess not exactly this stage, we tore that stage down and rebuilt this one, but somewhere in this area, we stood right here and we made vows to each other, similar to the vow that Jesus has made to you. I will never leave you or forsake you. In sickness and in health, till death do us part. You get the idea. Even though I have committed to be with Heather, to stand by her side and to be utterly committed to her. How many of you also know that two people can live in the same house and not really be in each other's lives? It's really down to how much she wants me in her life. Because Heather can be going through something and if she doesn't invite me in, if she doesn't say, hey, wait, come into this situation, I can be right there beside her, but guess what? I'm not getting in. She has to invite me. And although Jesus is right beside you and he has promised to never leave you or forsake you, friend, it is altogether appropriate for you to pray, come, Lord Jesus. Come, be a part of whatever's happening right here. Yesterday, as I was planning and preparing for this sermon, one of the ways that I prepare for sermons is I preach them to myself, just kind of quietly get alone and I just kind of, you could say rehearse, but I'm, I'm, I'm preaching it to myself. And when I came to this part of the sermon and I was just meditating on these words, come Lord Jesus, I just had the sense that right here, right now, we just collectively as a congregation here in the room and those watching online, we ought to just pray, come Lord Jesus. Because I know, like me, Many of you are facing situations that are bigger than what you can handle. Maybe you've lost a job recently. Maybe you're dealing with financial pressure that's mounting on you as kind of 2020 takes its toll on your business, with your job. Maybe you've gotten a diagnosis or maybe you have a, a loved one who's in the hospital right now or battling something right now that you're walking through with them and there's a sense of unease and uncertainty with it all because, well, this is someone that I love and gosh, what's gonna happen and how will we if and all of the thoughts that run through your mind and heart come, Lord Jesus. Maybe there's something that's happening with one of your kids. Maybe you just got a kid who's a little off the rails, a little distant, a little far from God right now, and you've just been praying for them to come home, but there's a a nervousness in you, a fear in you, maybe even some guilt and some shame about decisions that you've made, choices that you've made that you feel like you could have done better or whatever. I know what that feels like, trust me. You need Jesus to step into that situation. All over this room, there are needs. Can I tell you, we serve a God who specializes in meeting needs. And so today, right there where you sit, right there in your living room or kitchen or wherever you are this morning, I want us to go to Jesus. I want us to invite him into this place. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Lord Jesus, We are needy. We like to think that we're self-sufficient. We are not. And Lord, this year has been a stormy, chaotic year. The wind is blowing and the waves are high and we are uncertain 
of what we're to do. And maybe even some of us, Lord, we're hitting the panic button because we don't know where else to turn. We today, right now, resolve to turn to you. And we, Lord, boldly ask, come, Lord Jesus. Work in our lives. Work in our bodies. Work in our uncertainty. Work in our fear and our anxiety to bring shalom, wholeness, completeness, peace. I pray, Lord, for those who have lost jobs or are dealing with the loss of income and financial pressure that is mounting. Lord, I pray you would give them peace. Not just a shoulder <coughs> to cry on, Father, but peace, a confidence knowing that you are with them, even in the uncertainty. Father, for those dealing with sickness, for those dealing with a bad diagnosis, a loved one in the hospital, <coughs> Father, I pray for healing. Stretch forth your hand and heal, O oh Lord. I pray that by your stripes, people in this congregation would be healed of whatever it is that ails them. In Jesus' name, we speak life and vitality and strength into our bodies, into the bodies of those in Church on the Move, especially those that are hurting. Father, I pray for peace in family situations, peace where there is worry, peace where our minds are troubled. I pray, Lord, for a spirit of confidence and boldness and an assurance that you are with us. You have not left us on our own, but you are with us. You're so close, you became one of us. Come, Lord Jesus. We need you, and we thank you in advance for what you will do and what you are doing because we call on you. We thank you, Jesus, for moving and working among us. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. You're in the room and you say, Wit, I need Jesus to come into my life. I'm not right with God. Jesus isn't the center of my life. I'm not talking about believing in Jesus. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but they don't have him at the very center of their lives. These are two different things, and I'm talking about meeting the real Jesus. When Jesus gets into the center of your life and your heart, changes everything. That's you this morning. You say, I want Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, into the center of my life. If that's you, I'd love for you to slip your hand up right there where you sit. Just let me know that that's you. I want to pray for you. I see you, sir, up there in the risers. Thank you. Over here to my far left, thank you so much. Anybody else? Yep, right down here in front. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pray for you here in just a second, but I would love for you just to do something bold and just acknowledge that I need this. That's you over here to my right somewhere. Yep, I see you up there in the risers. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? You want Jesus at the very center of your life. You're ready to make that commitment. You're saying, come, Lord Jesus, today. I need you. Anybody else? I'm gonna wait for just another second. Awesome. Yes, sir. I see you back there in the back of my right, right section over here. Yes, thank you. Yep, I see you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good to see you guys. Anybody else? Yep, right over here. Man, hands keep coming up. I'm going to pause for just a second over here. Yes, right here in my front. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep, right out here in front. Another hand lifted. Jesus at the center. Come, Lord Jesus. Yep, another hand over here. Another two hands in the back back here. Thank you. Incredible hands going up all over the place. If you're online and you would like to let us know, just let us know in the chat. I want to pray for you too. Anybody else? Anybody else at all? So many bold, bold, courageous people this morning acknowledging their need. Yep, for Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My goodness. Yep, I see you up there waving your hat at me. Thank you. Golly, thank you. So many people. So many people. Where else? Over here somewhere to my right. Honestly, it doesn't matter if I see you. This is really between you and God. You're just acknowledging your need for Jesus. Wow, I'm gonna pray for you like I said I would. Let's do that together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Heaven is rejoicing right now because hands have been lifted who are acknowledging I want Jesus at the very center of my life. Thank you, Jesus. 
I pray you would give these who raise their hands the boldness to take the next step. Fill them with courage, Lord, so that they can do what they need to do to journey and continue this journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Look up here. If you raised your hand today, and there were so many people that raised their hands today, here's what I want you to do. As we leave and dismiss, at every one of our exits, there's a table It just says next steps. Stop by there. Number one, we have a free gift for you, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is I want you to be connected to a person. We have a team of people. They pray for you during the week. They look forward to connecting with you. Here it is. These are the people that want to journey with you in your walk with Jesus. They want to help you get connected. And let me tell you this. Your chances of seeing real change in your life go up exponentially when you determine that you're not going to try to do this alone. Don't be the Lone Ranger. Don't be Batman in this situation. You need help. You need a team. You need a family. That's what we are here for. If you're unwilling to take this next step to connect with somebody, I'm telling you, the chances of you sticking this out with Jesus, they're not that great. Take this step. Stop by grab this book and connect with us. We don't want to bother you, but we want to get you connected into community. If you're online, you can connect with us that way. Let us know that you raised your hand. We want to connect with you that way. And uh, we want to journey with you. And by the way, church, so many hands raised today. Can we just put our hands together and celebrate? I mean, it's amazing. So good. Well, hey, stand to your feet. I want to pray a blessing over you. Next week, we're talking about joy. Pastor Lee will be teaching. It's going to be a great weekend. Let me pray this blessing over you and your family. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.